a warm welcome to all of you and thank you all so much for coming. We really appreciate your, your being here and all the travel that's involved and we're anxious to hear about your great ideas and we love it that you bring your positive spirit and we know that that will influence a very um, uplifting afternoon for us. And there's no better way to start the afternoon than with our guest speaker, Danny Van Leeuwen from Boston. Danny wears many hats in healthcare. He is a patient with MS. He's been a caregiver to family members at the end of life. He is a nurse with a master's in public health. He's a patient and caregiver activist, and he's very interested in learning what works for people. And then understanding that, developing, um, enhancing the patient experience through quality improvement. So in your packet, you have his bio with all sorts of interesting healthcare ventures that he's involved with. And also, you have copies of the slides that um, he will be showing. So on a personal note, Danny is a devoted grandfather to two grandsons. He um, is a musician, plays the baritone sax, and he was a friend to our friend and former support group leader in Boston, Jack Whelan. So there's a very special connection here, and we are just delighted to welcome Danny. Thank you so much. Well, good morning. It's really great to be here. Um, and again, like uh, um, Jack and I have had a lot of conversations over the years, um, and uh, he taught me a lot. And uh, I loved his sense of humor, especially that he had a going away party. Um, I, I thought that was a riot. That was a great way to do it. Um, anyway, so what, what we're here to do today uh, uh, is to talk about um, the experience of making decisions. Because as you know, um, there's hundreds of them, if not hundreds a day, of decisions that we make about our health. And so the way uh, this um, hour is going to go is I'll spend some time uh, at the beginning Pres uh, sharing with you like a framework that I have, um, so a context and um, pieces of making decisions. And then um, we'll talk about um, you and in your role as support people and how that might, uh, how you might be able to leverage your role as support people in helping people um, make decisions about their health. So um, you're, you'll, um, I, I put at your table two things. One is a, 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 um, a slide, uh, this slide, and I really hate it when people use slides that you can't read. Um, but it's such a good slide. So I gave you a copy um, at your at your chair so you could look at it more closely. The other thing you have is a card. And what I done is um, I have a website and on that website I created a page specifically for this presentation. So um, it'll have a little information about me, it'll have the slide deck, eventually it'll have the, um, the video and it has some resources on it that you can um, refer to um, to uh, further your exploration of this topic. And there'll be a place to um, ask questions and make comments so that we can have a continuing conversation. I'm one of these people that I leave a presentation and I thought, well, the presentation was pretty good, but by the time I walk out the door, I have five questions that I never thought to ask. And so this is a, a way for you to do that. Okay, so what you see here is, as you know, um, having a uh, chronic illness is crazy complex. And we tend to focus on the medical when we know that really the medical part of it is very small. 
Um, and so this is actually the best presentation I've ever seen of the complexity of chronic illness. And it was made by a friend of mine, her name is Kristen Lind. And she has a son on the autism spectrum who has uh, many complex uh, challenges. And um, she found herself uh, being really frustrated trying to communicate with the doctors that there was more to life her life, his life, managing life, than the medical stuff. And she wasn't good at um, explaining that. And so she developed this chart. And I added developmental, school, medical, legal, whatever, you know, the, the, the categories. But the, the colorful part is her. And um, I think it's just a really dramatic uh, layout of how complex life can be when you either have uh, a chronic illness or you're supporting somebody uh, with a chronic illness. There's just so much you gotta deal with. Now, in, in the scientific community, um, they talk about determinants of health. And um, determinants of health are um, uh, your physical environment, your, behavior, your individual behavior, biology and genetics, um, and um, a small part of that is medical. But this is way more interesting to me than uh, the science look at it. So anyway, and you have it in front of you so you can um, look at it in some more uh, detail. Okay, so I think it's important when you're thinking about making decisions to think about, well, what's important to me? Um, and and I, I sort of break it down in that, you know, when you're healthy, you want to stay well. When you have an acute issue, you want to get over it. And when you have a chronic illness or you're nearing end of life, you want to have the best life possible. So um, it really, um, so let's let's think about that a little bit. So when you're when um, well, let me start just telling you about me. So I have multiple sclerosis. I have secondary secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. And when I first was diagnosed, um, my neurologist said, "Well, you know, I know a lot about um, the drugs and therapeutics for the treatment of uh, MS. And frankly, I don't know crap about you." And um, so our first job is for me to get to know you and what's important to you. So we're meeting again in two weeks. So why don't you come back and let's talk about what's important to you. And so I thought, oh my goodness. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. Um, this is like a, a physician that was interested in me. And um, so I came back and I said, well, you know, the things that are important to me are I want to progress as slowly as possible, so I have a progressive illness. I, I want to spend quality time with my family. I, um, I don't want to do anything that's going to mess with my pathological optimism. I'm an upbeat kind of guy, and I feel like that's something you know, that I have going for me. And um, I play the baritone saxophone, and I want to keep playing the saxophone. And he said, oh, that's great. Um, we can work with that. So I have a sense of what's important to me in my life. And so then I think about the decisions that I make. So when you think about um, staying well, I mean, this is basic stuff, right? It's like adequate hydration. It's uh, getting the exercise you need. It's you know, having a good diet. Uh, it's doing the things that are important in your life. It's having meaningful work. Um, so these are examples of uh, personal goals that you have in your life. Um, so if you have acute illness, so you sprained your ankle, you have a tummy ache, um, you know, you have a cold, the flu, whatever, you have an acute illness, and what you want to do is you want to get over it. So, you know, that's your goal. So then all the things that are important to you that... Um, uh, to stay well are still goals, but then you want to, you know, relieve pain, you want to um, continue to manage your life, you want to take your medications, you know, you have personal goals. 
And when you have a uh, chronic illness or you're nearing end of life, y y you want to live the best life possible. So the things that are important to stay well are still important. Things about getting over it are still important um, because, you know, as my primary care physician says, I'll send you to the specialist, but you're still a 65-year-old white man, and you have, you know, 65-year-old white man issues, um, and, you know, I'm here to deal with those issues. But, but you know, when you are, um, when you have chronic illness, you know, then you're, you know, dealing with, you know, more, um, you know, you want to build a team, you want to have a care partner, um, you want to prioritize what matters to you, whether that has to do with function or that has to do with milestones in your life. Um, so the, the, the idea is that you're making decisions about something, you know, and that's different for everybody. And it's important to have a sense and to be able to verbalize what's important to you because that's, that's what the decisions are about is are you going to get to, um, are you more likely to get to what's important to you? Now, this image here that you see in the middle, um, that's Arabic, and I just wanted you to know what that says, and I don't read Arabic, but I'm told it says your goals need to be realistic and worthy of accomplishing. And I thought, well, that's good. Uh, I'm for that. So how are you going to get there? You know, how do you get to whatever it is your personal goals are? So again, for me, um, I don't want to mess with my pathological optimism. I want to progress as slowly as possible. I want to play my saxophone, and I want to hang out with my family. Um, so what we're going to talk about are the different steps in um, and the different pieces of making decisions. So creating a team, making the choices, planning care. You can see this list. I don't need to read it to you. We're going to uh, go over that in, in some detail. We all need a team. Lord knows I do. Um, well, so yeah, Lord knows I do. Um, I need a team, and I have a team, and I'm very uh, mindful about the team that, that I've developed. And um, for me, the team starts with my family. So I, I'm married. I've been married for 43 years. So um, my wife is, you know, my most important team member, and um, she's my care partner. Actually, um, I had been diagnosed for, I don't know, a few years, and I found myself, I was being such a jerk. And, and you know, I was thinking, thinking, oh my God, I'm such a jerk to my wife, and she doesn't deserve this, what is going on? So I said, honey, I'm so sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm being a jerk, and I'm trying to like understand, and I realized that, um, you know, I was just getting used to the idea that I need help. And um, well, this was like new for me. And um, I said, you know, I'm, I'm not like, uh, it's really hard for me to accept that I need a care, you know, that I need a caregiver. And she goes, I am not your caregiver. I'm your partner. And I said, okay, honey, that's great. Thank you. So she's my care partner. And then, you know, I have um, adult children and a sister. So I have a family that's part of my team. I have um, a primary care physician. I see, I don't know, six specialists. Um, I use uh, two or three different pharmacies. Um, I uh, have a, a, a durable medical equipment supplier. Um, I have uh, mobility uh, assistance and, and um, so I have an acupuncturist, I have a chiropractor, I have a physical therapist, you, you, you know. I mean, you have a team. And, and I, think at, I think where people start, for me, when I'm working with people, where I want to start is, do you know who your team is? And is it a good team? Because, you know, a team member is not a team member is not a team member, you know, I mean, some people are really good team members and some people are pretty bad at it. And um, I happen to be fortunate, I live in Boston where, you know, I have choice. Now, some places don't have so much choice, but I think that if you are unhappy with a team member, um, it's time to find a new one. 
um, because having a team is really important uh, in terms of getting through um, getting through that, getting through whatever we're do, do, getting through. So then what we're, you know, the meat of this is about making choices. So again, I, um, we have goals. So we're trying to get somewhere. We're on a journey to get where we're going. Um, I don't think we're ever really there. You know, it's not like, you know, we're going to McDonald's and we get to McDonald's. It's like, it's like a never ending journey. Um, and, and there are tons of decisions to make. Now, um, probably the, some of the harder decisions are, you know, what's the protocol that you're going to follow and um, what clinical trial you're going to be in. But, you know, there's so many more. Um, and as we said, when I showed you the, the um, map that uh, Chris and Lynn made, um, so many of them are not um, uh, um, uh, medical. Now, the thing about making choices is that there is like there's evidence, right? So we talk about, you know, clinical studies. And the perspective I wanted to share with you, or this is my perspective, I'm very Im involved in the uh, research industrial complex. I am not a researcher myself, but I review funding requests for an organization called PCORI, Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, which grant, it's like NIH, and it grants actually billions of dollars in um, research, patient-centered research. And, but the thing about research is that it is comparing um, different routes you could take that are likely to be effective. So we don't do research on things that are no-brainers. You know, we don't do research on whether you look both ways to cross the street. You don't need research. You look both ways before you cross the street. So from there, research is about likelihood. And it's about likelihood of populations. And um, as my neurologist, bless his heart, has told me, is that um, just because it works for populations doesn't mean it's going to work for you. And so it's, it's important to, um, and actually this is a conversation I had a lot with Jack Whalen, is about, you know, uh, he would go be part of a clinical trial and he would say, Danny, you know, I'm part of a clinical trial and I'm sorry, I don't remember what the clinical trials were, but that wasn't what was important about the conversation. And he would say, well, you know, it's not working. And I, I'm stop. I'm not going to do it anymore. And I don't care about the research. I don't care about the scientists. I don't care about the study. It's not working for me. I'm going to try something else. So he's making some decisions. I think that um, you know that most decisions involve again my behavior, um, my physical environment. So all these other determinants of health um, that aren't medical. And those are uh, decisions as well. So for me, uh, I have MS. And um, I, I have uh, a, a certain um, chemotherapy that, that I use that, you know, and when I got started on Medicare, um, Medicare didn't pay for it anymore. And so it was um, another, uh, I had to make, you know, we had a choice, choose a different uh, chemotherapy, $65,000 a dose. I mean, who comes up with this stuff? Um, and then I take a medication which is, um, uh, with, uh, it's a potassium channel blocker, and it's the one medication that really makes a difference in my life because it really helps me walk. And when I don't take it, I don't walk that well. And so, um, but again, um, when I was on my wife's insurance, you know, um, I paid $75 a month for this drug and when I went on Medicare, um, I was going to have to pay $853 a month for it. And well, you know, I got, I got a mortgage and, um, you know, put food on the table and I am on a fixed income and so, I, you know, I couldn't afford it. And so thankfully, you know, my um, uh, 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 neurologist said, well, you know, before it was, it's called Ampira, before there was Ampira, which is a sustained release um, uh, medication, uh, um, it was a compounded drug. 
And you know, there's a pharmacy in Florida and you can get it from them. It just means you need to take it more often. And um, it's costing me $40 a month. Well, I can afford $40 a month. Medicare doesn't pay for it because it's not a covered drug in Medicare. But hey, it's not $853 a month. But I'm telling you this story because the impact on cost is really uh, a big deal in decisions that um, people make. Um, so I think that as people are making choices, I'm nervous about making a mess again. Um, anyway, uh, when people are making choices, like there's some basic questions um, that you can help them ask. You know, do I really need this test or procedure or drug? What if I don't take it? What are the risks and what are the side effects? Like, I, I know I'm telling you stuff that you already know, um, but just to like, in, you know, encapsulate it a little bit. Is there a safer option? Is there another option? What happens if I don't do anything? Um, how much does it cost and will my, my insurance pay for it? So there's, these are not like really medical questions, but they are really impact the decisions that you make um, about your your care and your health. So let's think about um, some uh, scenarios. So you know, a really common scenario is immunization, right? So um, you know, there's immunization for the flu, there's immunization for pneumonia, there's in immunization for shingles, there's in immunization for measles, and you know, the, your 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 primary care physician is just going to say, uh, "Your time, it's time for you know whatever," and this the the evidence is really strong, and um, it's a one-time decision, and even though there's very strong evidence about um, immunizations. <laughs> There's a significant cohort of people that don't do it. They're, they, they're not into immunization. So the evidence has a role, and, um, but you know, people, it's a one-time decision. So take another type of uh, decision that you're all familiar with, which is like stop smoking. So the evidence is pretty clear that smoking isn't good for you. Um, and um, you're gonna, your clinician is gonna recommend that you stop smoking. Um, but you know, there's lots of different ways to stop smoking. You know, you can go cold turkey, you can wear a patch, you can have therapy. Um, you know, there's different ways and there's evidence about each different way. But it's not a one-time decision. If you decide to stop smoking, that's a decision forever. And um, you're constantly making that decision over and over again. If you think about, um, so people, you know, I'm a 65-year-old white man, and so 65-year-old white men have trouble peeing, right? And um, there's, there's different tests to you know, manage this. There's different, if you're having trouble, there's different ways you can do it. And there's um, different strengths of evidence for all of that. And it's, it's personal, and you, know, you, you make decisions based on what's important to you and what you're trying to accomplish. So, let's see, do I have another example? So, another example that I'll share with you is um, infection pre prevention, right? So, um, you know, you go to the hospital and, you know, there's a protocol for infection pre prevention, the least of which is not washing your hands, right? Is, wa is washing your hands. That's the most important thing. Um, and then there's others related to uh, preventing um, uh, uh, intravenous infections, you know, bloodstream infections, uh, uh, urinary infections, kidney infections from catheters. Um, and um, there are protocols and and well-researched protocols that mostly clinicians do. But I think as you know, and as like you guys have told me as I've introduced, I don't touch anybody. Um, you know, there's, uh, uh, and sometimes even clinicians who ought to know better um, don't follow uh, the protocols even though there's a tremendous amount of evidence for it. So I'm uh, sharing that with you that there's different kinds of evidence and different kinds of decisions. And personally, I'm not a person that thinks that there is a right decision, you know, somewhere in the ether. Um, I mean, I think there's a right decision, like don't cross the road without looking both ways. Like, that's a pretty, you know, 
Um, but otherwise, I think there's, there's so many factors related to making decisions. I'm not going to spend too much time here, um, but one of the things that you may hear uh, is something called patient-centered clinical decision support. And I have a definition here that you can read, but I think what's important about this is that, um, and, and I think this is, has an impact for you as support people and resources, is that to be thinking about the five rights. Now, I sort of look at the um, all this information that's out there as sort of a fog you know you're walking through this really thick fog and it's just like information 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 oh my goodness it's just overwhelming and I, one of the things that i think is important is to be thinking about this five rights so getting the right information at the right time to the right people in a way that they can understand it in a, cha in, a, in a channel that makes sense to them. So what's a channel? You know, some people are uh, visual learners. Some people are oral learners. Some people want to see it on YouTube. Um, you know, there's different, people are different. And they take in information differently. And so with this fog of information, uh, uh, and I'm sure that's something um, with, um, uh, with, with that you guys have to deal with. There's just, there's a lot and it's overwhelming. And, and um, you guys are veterans. And so you, you see, you, you've learned to filter. And I'm sure the people that you're working with, this is something that they need help with, is you know, how, to, how to get the information they need when they need it in a manner that they can uh, um, take it in. Here we are, we've, um, we're, we've figured out like what's important to me, my goals in life. Um, I have a team. Um, there's lots of decisions to make. We make some decisions. Well, then you need a plan. Like, how are you gonna get there? You know, are you gonna take a right turn? Are you gonna take a left turn? When are you gonna stop for gas? There's lots of decisions to make. And, and I think that this plan is partially, um, you know, who's going to do what? When are they going to do it? Including you, including me, including my care partner, including my family, including my doctor, including whoever on my team. It's who's going to do what and when are they going to do it? Um, I think that it's also what could possibly go wrong? Well. A ton, right? I mean, you know, I mean, there's dramatic things could go wrong, like bleeding, you know, uh, depression. Like for me, that's a big deal because, you know, I'm, I don't want to mess with my pathological optimism. So I don't want to do something that I think is going to mess with my pathological optimism. So what could go wrong? How can we prevent it? And what are we going to do if it happens? You know, so what happens if I do this and I bleed? What do I do? Is that something I can handle myself? How do I know when um, I need to go get help? You know, and is that help I can get on the phone? Is that help I can get on the web? Is that something I need to go to an urgent care center or the emergency room? So it's making a plan. So one of the, um, I was, I had a dinner with um, some of you fine folks last night, and one of the things that I heard you talking about was neuropathy. Well, that's something I have to deal with as well, neuropathy. And, um, you know, so uh, when um, my, uh, my neurologist said, well, let me put you on gabapentin, right, Neurontin. And I'm going, well, is that going to mess with my pathological optimism? And he said, well, you know, it might. It's a you know, drug that was designed for seizure and it you know, suppresses impulses. And I said, ah, I don't think I want to take that. Well, he could have said, well, he's non-compliant. Well, I was non-compliant. Um, you know, and I said, well, you know, what I really want to do is I want to try, um, you know, uh, mindful meditation and acupuncture and uh, ibuprofen. And he said, well, you know, I don't really know that much about acupuncture and chiropractic and, you know, meditation, but I'm into anything that works for my patients. So you, you try, here's the prescription, fill it or don't, um, uh, and try what you want to try 
and then, you know, let me know how it works and maybe I'll learn something. Again, I think I've died and gone to heaven. And um, so it's, you know, so I came up with a plan. And the good news is that I, I still have the symptoms of a neuropathy and they're seriously annoying, just like, you know, MS is seriously annoying. But, you know, I'm not taking Neurontin and um, I, rec I know what I need to do. You know, and I know the, what to do to take the edge off so it doesn't like consume me. You know, I mean, what good is it if you have, you know, it's like chronic pain. You know, if you're consumed by the pain, that like, you know, then how do you hang out with your family? You know, so anyway, so um, I, I, um, I was able to plan care. We can plan care trying different things. The thing that I want to impress upon you is that I think that managing your health is like one grand experiment. And it's like life, right? You, it's a grand experiment. And you try stuff and it works or it doesn't. So the evidence, again, the evidence will say that if, you know, that this treatment or this study or this therapeutic or whatever is likely to be beneficial um, and you do it. Well, it works or it doesn't. And I think it's important to have the perspective that it, it's, it's an experiment. And it's not a failure if it doesn't work. It's just another piece of evidence. Now, you just asked my wife. I learn a lot more from my mistakes um, than I learn from my successes. And um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm grateful that I'm a learning, I have learning capacity and I can learn. So, um, people, I think that a thing about being, a, having a, being an experiment of one, me, you, um, is I need to keep track of stuff. There's so much going on. So I make lists, you know, I make a list. And so the list is of the medications I need to take and when I need to take them. The list is how many steps do I do every day? You know, my goal is to get 3,500 to 4,000 steps a day. And I have to keep track of that kind of stuff. First of all, keeping track motivates me to do it. And it also helps me look, oh, well, I've slacked off. Or um, I keep track of how many minutes I play my horn every day. So I, you know, I play between three and six hours a week. And that feels good, you know. Um, and I journal. So I think that if I'm part of, if I am an experiment, I need to keep track of what I'm doing and how it's working so that we can learn and so then I can go to either professionals or family members and you know um, I can go I mean I remember I got pneumonia I started on this new chemo and it really suppressed my um, immune system and I got pneumonia and you know I sat down with my daughter-in-law and you know she said so what's your plan you know and so we wrote you know we made a list you know my plan is my plan is always number one is drink plenty of water because I am just so relieved to know that when I feel like crap, um, the first thing I do is drink more water. And I have to say that 75% of the time I feel better. Wow, that is cheap and there are no side effects. And so, you know, the first thing on the list is drink water. Um, then, you know, an inhaler, deep breathing, you know, take my antibiotics, get plenty of rest, you know, so I, a plan for a, a specific problem. So again, it's an experiment. The next thing is sharing information. So again, I have a goal, I have a team, I have a plan, I'm keeping track of it. And then like, how are we gonna share this? You know, I mean, I live in Boston and Boston has like the best medical systems. It has the best technology. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I'm the person that shares information from team member to team member. They don't know. My primary care physician, I love her. 
and and she is very serious about keeping track of me and trying to understand me as a whole person and all the things that I'm involved in. Um, but I'm still the one that, you know, she'll say, oh, you went to the urologist. What happened? You know, um, he didn't post his report. He didn't send me anything. Um, you know, and so I'm still the guy that is the the connection and there's different kinds of sharing information I think there's um, there's the handoff right so the handoff is between members of a team so family members you know from one family member to another from you're in the hospital and from one resident to another um, from uh, the nursing staff from one nurse to another so they're handing off um, and then there's the sharing across settings, right? So from home to the doctor's office, from doctor's office to home, to the hospital, to a long-term care facility, to whatever. Excuse me. So there's sharing information. And is all that information in one place? This is the one place. And so um, here we are again. Uh, trying to get somewhere, meet our personal health goals, and we have a plan, and how's it going, um, and sharing the information um, that's uh, important there. So I've already talked a little bit about the experiment, but I think um, one of the things that, that I really enjoy uh, about my, actually my life and my work, is what works, what works for people. I wanna tell you a little story about uh, some, one of the people who's really made a difference in the whole thing about learning what works. There's a, 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 a research physician in fibromyalgia, chronic pain, in the University of Alabama, his name is uh, Jared Younger. And he's a fellow who um, is really interested in um, helping people who have fibromyalgia, chronic pain. Um, and um, he, he's kind of amazing. Is that What he does is he does like webinars and tweet chats, and he'll put out in the ether that he's gonna have something in four days. And 500 people will log on. It's like incredible. And he'll start with a little bit about, you know, the research he's doing and the limitations of research. But what he's really trying to do is he's trying to learn what works for people. His rap is that research is looking in a rearview mirror. It's looking at what somebody else said might work and then testing it. But he wants to know what people who are dealing with a problem every day. And so he'll listen and he'll have people tell him, well, what are you doing that works? And if he can find five people who are doing something similar that's working for them, he'll fund a descriptive study of those five people. He'll leverage that into a thirty to fifty to hundred thousand dollars study of thirty people, and then he'll leverage that into an NIH grant of millions of dollars. And he has really pushed the boundaries of uh, fibromyalgia and chronic pain treatment. So I think this whole idea of that it's an experiment and learning what works. But you know, you're supporting people who are trying to learn what works and trying things and doing experiment. And so these pictures are very purposeful. Um, learning what works when you're on a tightrope in the Grand Canyon, um, if it doesn't work, it's over. You know, there's no, you know, you're gone, right? And if you're really sad or depressed, it is really hard to take that step back and think about, well, what have I tried? What worked? You know, because you're, I mean, one of the reasons that I don't want to mess with my pathological optimism is I feel like that really helps me um, take that step back and be reflective. So I think that um, for you all, as being um, uh, resource people and support people, a really important thing is having that function. So what are you doing? You know, what worked? What didn't work? You know, and help them take that step back and look at the grand experiment of their life. 
And finally, actually, I think, though not, you know, if it's an experiment, and as Jack said, um, if it doesn't work, try something else. So it seems like a no-brainer, but you know, it's 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 hard. <laughs> it's hard to try something else. It's hard to admit it didn't work and try something else. But I think that. Um, I think that's where my family really comes in, um, is that they're, they're more, you know, they're, they're more straight with me. Is this working? Well, not really. Okay, well, what are, you, what are we gonna do now? You know, helping me to uh, keep, keep adjusting. Okay, now I, I, want, now I wanna talk about you guys. So, you know, you are people who have lived experience, right? I mean, lived experience means you get it. You've been there. And lived experience is a really important thing, and in some worlds that's called peers. But frankly, I think lived experience and a buck fifty might buy you a Pepsi. Um, because I think that there's a lot more. I, I'm sure you've seen that people who have lived experience, they're like really full of their lived experience. And that's all they know. And that's all they can relate to is their personal experience. But you know, people who are patients and caregivers weren't born that way, most of them. Um, and, and they have skills. So whether those skills are, um, you, you know, you have skills in marketing, you have skills in printing, as uh, somebody I spoke to yesterday, um, you have uh, experience in web stuff, you have experience in writing, you, people have skills. And so I think that when you take lived experience and skills, plus you take a person such as yourselves who are good communicators and know how to listen um, and they have system thinking and system thinking means you can take that 30,000 foot view and think about the pieces and how they all work together and how one you know influence the other and people who care so if you add lived experience skills communication and systems thinking and care, that's priceless. And so that's you guys. So I want to talk to you about your role from the perspective of the clowns. Now, I used to work at Boston Children's and I led their patient family experience initiative. And one of the coolest things there was the, it was called the Big Apple Circus then, and now it's called the Laughter League. And um, these are the professional entertainers, clowns, who are spend all day going into people's rooms and interacting with the kids and their families or going to procedures and being there with them and, um, you know, spending five minutes and making something out of that five minutes. And I took a class from them and the class was about reading the room and uh, it was brilliant. And I was just, I went back there uh, about a month ago because I'm giving a talk in um, November at the uh, National Caregivers Conference and I'm gonna do uh, a session on um, what we can learn from the clowns. And um, uh, I was sort of surprised they accepted my proposal and then it was, oh my goodness, now I gotta deliver. And so I went back to the clowns. And when we were talking about, you know, what is it that why are they so good at what they're doing? And what can we learn as support people um, from the clowns? So I think they said that the most important thing for them is that whenever they enter a new situation, which is like 50 times a day, they take several deep breaths and they just calm themselves and try to, you know, you know, meditative type, take deep breaths and, relax and the next thing that they do is like what are they there to do are they are they there to um, lighten the mood are they there to um, help with pain relief and fear 
And I think what's relevant for us as um, caregivers and support people is that there are all these little scenarios. Let's, so just take going to the doctor's office, right? So here is this very pregnant situation with a lot of tension and expectations and you've got if you're lucky, you got 20 minutes. If you're not lucky, you got eight minutes. And you're trying to accomplish something. So what is it that you're there to do? Are you there to hold somebody's hand? Are you there to be a recorder? Are you there to be a nag? You know, did you do this? Did you do that? Um, it's important to know, since you only have a really brief amount of time, it's important to know what you're trying to accomplish. Then I think it's being on the same page with the person you're with. So I know that when, um, you know, I was the uh, a care partner for um, my grandmother, my mother, and my son on their end of life journeys. And I know that um, one of the things that was really important uh, as their care partner was that I was on the same page, you know, and you know, that I was trying to help them accomplish something instead of accomplish what I wanted to accomplish or what I thought needed to be accomplished. And so getting on the same page so that that, you know, seven to 20 minutes is, is valuable, that you're, you're on the same page. Now, um, I did have a conversation the other day about, um, well, what if it's your child and they're three years old? And uh, I said, well, I guess that's like, you know, if you're uh, the person that you're uh, supporting has dementia. You know, it's altered, you know, altered uh, cognitive states or different cognitive states. But, you know, people, no matter what their cognition is, they have feelings and they have expectations and it's our job to figure out what is it that's important to them and how can I as a support person help them uh, to do it. I think another thing that I learned from the clowns is that failure works. They impressed upon me that they feel like they are successful no more than 60% of the time. So they're just, you know, they said they'll like, you know, go into the room and they'll just fail. You know, they didn't lighten the load. They didn't reduce the tension. The person was still in tremendous pain. Um, it didn't, they weren't successful. And, and they said, that's just the way it is. You know, you cannot be involved with people's lives in these intimate moments when things are awry and difficult and you can't it, you can't hit it out of the park every time and that that's it's really important to accept it and so one of the things that they do is they they usually work in pairs and so they'll step out of the scene whether it's the room or the procedure or whatever and they'll go okay let's see how'd that go oh man that was a disaster oh, we didn't we totally didn't do it and um and that's when they, for themselves, interject a little bit of humor into the situation. Like, I know that, um, I, I, I think, um, let's tell you two quick stories. Um, so my mom was a Holocaust survivor. And I don't know that growing up and through my adult life, I ever heard her laugh. And she had like zero sense of humor until she was dying of, um, pancreatic cancer. And so we're hanging out and she's going, you know, this dying crap, it is so boring. Um, she said, it's the four Ps. Uh, pills, pillow, poop, and piss. And I, you know, I mean, so we had a great laugh. You know, then she came up with another one, pain. So there's the five Ps. Um, and you know, oh, so sad. But, you know, I mean, appreciating the humor. My, my son, he died when he was 26. He had a, a metastatic um, a melanoma. And um, he was maybe, I don't know, six months um, and, and from dying. And um, he, was, he had this attitude, uh, um, what did he say? He said, 
I wasn't born with a tattoo on my ass telling me how long I had to live. And he really helped us find the humor in this heartbreak. Actually, today's his birthday. So, uh, uh, but, but, you know, it, 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 I don't know. You know, life's a bitch. <laughs> You know, and I think that one of the things, again, that I've, I've learned, I learned from the clowns was trying to find the humor in the tragedy um, that, you know, we're experiencing or the people we're supporting are, are experiencing. Okay, so um, really what I wanted to do was to hear from you guys. <laughs> and I wanted to, so I, here, I failed. Um, uh, I'm sorry. But, but what I want to, um, what I would be interested in is, um, so what, what's been working for you guys? Well, I'm going to do two things. One is, um, later on, um, I want you to pick something that you can try and write it down, partner with somebody, and exchange contact information, and talk to each other later and see what, what you can do. I think um, what I want to do right now is, if you don't mind, if you would take, um, if you have something you want to share, to just take a couple minutes and tell, tell us. So what's worked with you in supporting people of, of, in, in making choices? And what, what hasn't worked? Um, and, and how can you best help your members? So what, what can you share with us, somebody would you like to share? What works for you when you're helping people make choices about managing their, um, their illness? What do you mean, how do you know if it worked? What's the... the... To me, um, working, that's a good question. I mean, to me, um, working is like, okay, so I have um, neuropathy, like you can all relate to that, right? Um, and so working for me means that um, I, I, I'm not falling too often, um, that I, I'm not having pain so much that, you know, I can't hang out with my grandchildren, um, that I'm able to get closer to a personal goal. Like that to me is what working means. Um, you know, other people it might mean that your T cells aren't too low. Um, I don't know, it, everybody's different, but working has to do with that you're closer to what you're trying to accomplish. But, but as, a, as a peer support person, yeah. how do you know the peer support? Oh, I would, I, well, um, I think, um, well, I think uh, somebody calling you and wanting help, <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's, that's working. Um, I think, um, uh, I think that that's a good question um, as, a, as a support person. Um, well, I think if people are through the interaction with you that they're getting closer to what they're trying to accomplish, I think then you're, you're uh, what works for you as a peer support person? Like, what are you, as a, what, what are you trying to accomplish? So I think it's a similar. You have goals. It's important to think, wh why am I a support person? Am I a support person because um, I really care about people and I don't want them to suffer as much as I've suffered? Um, am I a support person um, because I'm a, you know, an extrovert? and um, I, I like to share, or are you a connector? Um, you're really good at linking resources and people. Um, I don't know. Yes, ma'am. Well, is that going to work? It, it, it works. It doesn't, it's not going to amplify you, but they'll hear it on the, oh, okay. the so just. Well, a very simple thing. I, I often get, well, I get called by somebody who's just discovered that they have Walden's jobs. And some doctors still give them the idea that, you know, they don't have very long to live. And um, I think a simple thing I can do is say, I was diagnosed in 2004. I'm doing fine. You know, I can play tennis. I can go hiking. I can, um, and I think that makes people feel, relax a little bit. Right. So that's, I think that's great because you can, you're giving some hope.
And so a goal is to give hope. Uh, that's great. So what's working for you guys? Yes, sir. One of the things I believe that support people can do is decrease isolation. You know, that all of these illnesses, whether it's this illness or a pick of one, it doesn't really make, make any difference what it is, people often feel how they're so alone. And uh, so support can often just be uh, not being isolated and by yourself with your, with your troubles. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. Thank you. I love that. Yes, ma'am. I've seen the group experience in the support group experience really work for people who come, especially newly diagnosed people who are struggling to make a decision about and whether to, what treatment to use, whether they should be treated, and they're questioning their local oncologist who maybe doesn't have any experience with Waldenstrom's, and they come to the group with, with all of these concerns and issues, and the group shares their experiences and what worked for them in making the decision, and there may be different opinions about how to do it, but they hear, they hear real life experiences about how people have handled certain situations, and then they come away feeling like, wow, I think I can do this too, and I can choose which, which approach to take, which fits my, my uh, what's really comfortable with me, because there are different approaches to take, you know, in dealing with decisions, and especially dealing with oncologists. So you have to do what's comfortable with you. And um, so I think the group experience can be very valuable. Telling stories, absolutely. I, I think we, in, in the support group, I think we empower the people there. Very often, especially the newcomers, you know, they have all these questions. And I say, well, did you discuss any of this with your doctor? Well, no, because we had so much other things to, and it takes them a while. But, you know, every time they bring up a good question, and I said, well, there's many ways to answer that, but you really need to ask your doctor how that pertains to you. And so I think that when they hear so many members in your group, and after you've had this disease for a while, everybody in the group is pretty knowledgeable and very supportive, which really helps the new people and empowers them to uh, take more confidence and more of a lead because, yeah, you've got a team, but if you're not the lead person, you really don't have a team. You really don't. You've got to take charge. And that's probably the, the biggest role that you have to take as a patient is to become in the charge of your care. So you're the CEO of your health team. Yeah. You bet. Right. You got a bunch of subcontractors. And uh, um, uh, yeah. so what, what, um, how do you guys involve the care partner? Um, because, you know, chances are as the support person, you're not going to the doctor with them. And so part of it is sort of coaching the care partner. Um, so, you know, I know that, uh, you know, uh, Bob isn't like really good at asking questions. Well, so maybe Janice, um, as his partner, you could, you know, are you comfortable asking those questions? At our age? Yeah. That's already developed. So if you've yeah. got a, a, a spouse, you've got lifelong, you know, one partner takes care of the finances, the other one takes the car in and has it done. So you see that in a support group where, yes, maybe the person who was the take charge and took care of everything is now the person with the illness. And that changes the dynamics of that family, of that unit. And it, it takes a while to recover and to find new roles. And uh, hopefully you're able to support them through that change. It can be, and if they don't, it can be very devastating to the patient as well as the family unit. And um, it, uh, that's when you gently suggest that maybe the doctor could refer them to 
you know, psychologist or an emotional support person because they got to work out a whole new dynamics, yes. at least for a while. Brilliant. Yes, ma'am. Take another one. <clears throat> Somebody else? How are we doing? We could do a few. We could, okay. Anybody? Yes, sir. Could you pass that back? Thank you. Yeah, that brought to mind uh, how sometimes roles can change, you know, like uh, um, there's a couple in our support group where um, she was the uh, caregiver uh, and uh, he had WM and then she developed Alzheimer's and now the roles have completely switched. So, you know, and, you know, if you have a close friend who has WM and they're going through treatment, you're holding their hand, you know, as they go through uh, chemo or whatever and, and then... Uh, it may be your turn later on, you know, so roles tend to switch over time. Um, and you have to be sensitive to that. Yeah. You know, um, I, I have to say, so my, the hat that I'm most proud of is that I'm an Opa, and that's Grandpa. And um, my grandchildren are, uh, well, 10 tomorrow and 7. And um, I'm pretty impressed with um, how supportive they are of me. Um, whereas, you know, um, when they were younger, um, you know, they would just sort of take off and with their parents or my wife. Uh, but they know when they're with me, they're holding my hand and they're sticking with me and they're, you know, looking both ways. You know, I mean, it's just interesting uh, to me to see how um, the dynamic uh, can change um, quite dramatically uh, depending on the you know your your position on the team <laughs> so to speak um, anybody else well this is great I mean oh oh I'm sorry I just wanted to say that um, not everyone has a a person who is capable of being that care partner, care person. So oftentimes, you know, the group can support that individual who does not have that person um, as, you know, as a peer or as a friend or, you know, as a, as a resource. I mean, they're not going to be actively involved, you know, day to day, but uh, they also, you know, have that support and that, that mentally is, is very valuable to a lot of people. Do you think that part of your role is, this is, it's not going to sound like, is like sort of a vacuum filler? You know what I'm saying? Is like, you know, that people, you know, people come into this with strengths and weaknesses, right? And um, nobody comes in with the full package. And, and so, you know, it seems like some of the time being a resource is figuring out where the gap is and, you know, sort of stepping into the gap. So whether it's information, whether it's connections, whether it's personal support. Um, so is that, do you think that there's some truth to that in terms of, it's, uh, yeah. I used to do group therapy. It was one of the jobs I had a thousand years ago. And the, the, <laughs> Viagra, you know, um, but the thing was always, you know, why did this work? And nobody knew why. Patients would come in and say, I feel better. I said, why? Nothing's changed. Yeah, I don't know, but I feel better. And groups do that. When people get together, they walk away feeling better. Even though the group itself may not have been able to make a change, we didn't changed medications, we didn't do any of that. We supported one another through the, you know, the, the, just the business of being ill. And somehow, with that, people walk away feeling better. And I used to describe it as going to a refrigerator. And you open the door, you look around, walk away, you didn't see anything you wanted. You go back again, you open the door, walk away. And the third time, you take something may not have been what you wanted the first time, but it was what was available. And that's what groups can do for people. It can fill a need. That's interesting. You know, I think uh, as well, um, I think that, you know, so I said, you know, that I'm a pathologically optimistic person and I don't want to mess with that. But I think everybody has variation. You know, it's a human condition, variation. So, you know, people can be like this 
you know, and I'm like this. And, and I know, though, when I'm here, as opposed to here, my symptoms are worse. There's just no question that um, if I'm relatively down, my symptoms are worse. And which is one of the reasons I don't want to mess with it um, because I don't like it. So anyway, yes, sir. Yeah, one of the things that I found is important as a support group leader is to listen and ask probing questions. And it relates to their environment, not just to the disease. I have one person that called recently that's from Southern Illinois with little health care, but his closest family member is a 90-year-old uncle, and he's like 70, and he has no caregiving support to speak of. He doesn't have the financial wherewithal or the medical community around him, so he's kind of isolated. Mm -hmm. But you, you kind of have to ask probing questions, and then you can just do the, your best to try to fill the gap. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. This has been great.